This is Wholesaling Houses Elite, the no fluff and BS podcast with tips and tricks to help you become an elite wholesaler. Our guest will spill the beans on what it takes to be the best. Hey, what's up, Wholesaling Houses Elite members? This is Max Maxwell, and welcome to Wholesaling Houses Elite podcast. And my guest today is Don and Amy from Wisconsin. And uh, you guys are like in Milwaukee in this one county I can't even pronounce. How do you say it? Waukesha. Waukesha. Waukesha County. I've actually been to Milwaukee. I went to, I think I went to a baseball game. Um, Is it Brewers? It is. Yeah, I've been to the Brewers Stadium and went to a baseball game. I'm not a huge baseball fan, but it was a great experience. And uh, I love that area, actually. So, Kind of uh, tell me a little bit about you two and kind of uh, you guys are wholesalers, right? Correct. Uh, Probably more than that, but, you know, part of it. Tell me a little bit about you guys and how you met and how you got started in this business. (laughs) Okay. Well, um, Don actually is originally from Wisconsin but uh, lives in Southern California right now. And and, uh, I'm here in Milwaukee, and we we actually met uh, in a Facebook group. And uh, Don had some leads that needed to be followed up on, and... And I'm here, so I volunteered to help him out, and we just sort of became friends from there, and, and it, it grew from there. How long have you guys been in business? Well, I've been uh, real estate investing since 2000, and I'm okay. uh, a broker and a real estate attorney, and and uh, it's not it's not much fun being a lawyer. <laughs> it's more fun in wholesaling houses and flipping houses, and so that's what I started to do because I was bored, and and uh, it's sort of taken off from there. That's that's yeah. pretty cool. What about you, Don? Are you originally from Wisconsin? You're in SoCal now. How did you get started in, in the real estate side of things? So, uh, like most, uh, I was kind of addicted to YouTube and some Facebook groups and kind of self-taught myself how to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one that I did was out here in Wisconsin, living in SoCal, uh, and I jumped down kind of the lease option path. And personally, I just kind of figured out that it was a heck of a lot of work for a smaller payday uh, for us. So... I kind of switched over to try to do the wholesale method and, and doing that. I reached out to Amy. I saw that she had posted on a Facebook group and we did a couple of deals, kind of more of a JV. And then as we grew, it kind of made more sense to, to partner up. And so we did that. That's awesome. I'll, I want to ask a question to both of you. You decide who goes first. When was the first time you remember hearing the concept of wholesaling? I can say for me, I was doing it and didn't know what it was. So I, I had a whole bunch of houses and I, I just didn't have enough time to, to do them all and mm-hmm. just lots of opportunity. And so I, I just reached out to some other investors and said, Hey, do you want it? And they said, well, what do you want for it? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Why don't you just throw me a couple grand and we'll call it a day. <laughs> and after five or six years of doing that, somebody told me I was wholesaling and I went, okay. Sure. Sounds good. What about you, Don? <laughs> uh, I actually found it, kind of learned about it from uh, the godfather Chico. So Mr. Chris Chico, I found him on online on YouTube and some other stuff. And there was some free videos out there that I watched and I kind of learned the, the methods and started trying to figure it out and Googled we buy houses and was trying to find people that were doing it out in Wisconsin market. Uh, and then I wound up running into Amy on the Facebook group and went down that path. So Amy, as as a real estate attorney, prior were you doing assignments prior to this so you kind of had an idea of what it was or, or you were just no no not at all in fact uh, i i actually went backwards on it i i started door knocking and and doing those things because i knew a lot about foreclosures and bankruptcies mm-hmm. and um so I, I really didn't have experience with any kind of assignment or anything it was all retail all commercial that kind of stuff but um once I started to, to learn about it, I, I, I got help too. I, I started talk, seeing all the guys who were doing it. I must have bought a million programs over, <laughs> over the years to learn how to do it right. And, but when I started, none of these guys were around with, with uh, you know, this program or that program. And so uh, a lot of it was, was making a lot of mistakes and um, you know, doing things that um, learning the hard way is never the right way to learn. So I, I always... I stopped learning the hard way and went and, and bought some programs and taught myself how to do it. Kind of accelerated right your stuff. And, and, and Don, you seem kind of like you did use Chris Chico, but you were kind of self-taught to advance yourself to the next level, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. 
I mean, my, you know, my background is military, so it's bulldoze your way through and figure yeah. it out. I will look for help. If I can find it, I'll use it. And from there, one way or another, I'm going to get to the other side. So now you two meet through Facebook, which is an amazing thing if you use it the right way. And now you're doing business together. What does your business look like now? How much percentage of it is wholesaling? What other type of investing do you do? What does the present day pad home buyers look like? So current day, we have pad home buyers, but we also have the brokerage. Um, we have a real estate. Uh, we've got a uh, agent with us that goes out on some of the property appointments that we have, as well as doing the retail side of things. Uh, and then we have uh, two VAs that uh, answer the phones and they'll do live as well as return calls and follow up setting the appointments. They work full time from the Philippines. And then we have one guy that uh, is disposition uh, and he does all of the contracts and sending them out to the buyers list and all that good stuff. And then Amy and I, of course. Um, and then for the wholesale side, uh, Dispo guy is the one that's you know selling off the contract. And then retail side, if we wholesale it, um, it's either Amy or the realtor that's posting and dealing with some of those showings and, and doing that. So what that looks like right now, it's, it's kind of a half and half of wholesale wholesale. Um, and there's been a few seller finance type deals in there, but mostly the wholesale hotel type uh, methods. Now, explain to us, because a lot of my viewers, our listeners are new. So when you say hotel, ex kind of break that down for us and kind of explain what that means. Okay. Well, in a typical wholesale transaction, you're just taking that property and you're either assigning it to another investor or you're double closing it with them. But either way, you're not keeping the property. You're not doing any of the work. You're just getting the property to the end buyer. When you're wholesaling it, it's typically a property that doesn't need a lot of work, but you've negotiated with that seller much like you would in a, in a typical wholesale. Um, but it's in good enough shape to put it on MLS and just sell it right away without needing that in-between type buyer. So what we'll do is we'll just get it from the seller and put it right on MLS and sell it out to a retail uh, buyer instead of necessarily a a investor buyer. So let's let's look at the logistics of that. You you negotiate typical wholesale, and you see that the property doesn't need that much work. What are your qualifying indicators to say, hmm, Don, this might be an actual wholesale? Well, it comes down to when the after repaired value is you know let's say this this is one that we're working on right now. The after repaired value for it is is 219 and your budget is less than five or six thousand dollars so it's carpet paint whatever and the seller tells you look we'll we'll sell it to you for cash for 170 thousand you've got a huge split there and you don't need to put a lot of money into it mm -hmm. um to really get to that after repaired value so for me as long as it's under ten thousand uh, dollars worth of repairs um, and a lot of it's just more cosmetic than anything else. It doesn't need a roof. It doesn't need a bathroom. It doesn't need electrical. Um, and just recognizing that, you know, it's, it's good enough once, once you paint and carpet. So you have to have some experience knowing what the repairs yeah. cost and what, you know, what so it will you're be not necessarily getting it to like 2018 looking standards. You're just getting it to a, 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 a livable good enough just doesn't need to hit the top of the ARV when you're done. Right. Okay. Right. That's, that's pretty interesting. Would you consider this an advanced kind of wholesaling method to where you would probably need money or transactional funds? How do you, how do you fund something like this? Cause I'm assuming you maybe have to buy it. Is, is that what happens? Well, we have one right now that the seller literally doesn't care. So that one we're not we're not going to buy it ahead of time. We're just going to probably do transactional of seven days, maybe before. Mm -hmm. So that one's kind of easy. Um, but usually you do have to close on them ahead of time before you can put them on MLS. And you, it is advanced. You need to know your MLS rules. You need to know a lot about uh, what things cost and what makes something acceptable versus not acceptable. So I, I would say it's not something that you want to try until you really have a good uh, feel for your market for what things cost, for values, and, and what's good enough versus, you know, this needs a lot of work. That, that makes, a, makes a lot of sense. I, I tell people when they're beginning, they hear so many different exit strategies, so many different marketing methods, and I tell them, look, just keep it simple because the reality is you probably only need to, 
to do one deal or a half a deal a month to be able to replace your W-2 income. So don't get complex and start adding all these tools or learning all these methods. Just kind of just do a simple wholesale deal, make five, ten thousand dollars. And then as you learn more, start doing stuff like wholesaling and on the subject twos and all, all that other type of stuff. Now, one more question before we move off of the hotel is the typical end buyer using financing when they're, when they're buying it from you. Yeah. So we've been able to get the local banks, credit unions and find that there's certain ones. If you work with them, talk with them, um, we can get it to where there's not seasoning. And that's really, you know, mm. something that you have to be aware of. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear of like the 90 day rule and things like that, where if we can find a local credit union or local bank that doesn't require that in their underwriting, um, you can get away with, you know, putting it on the MLS and selling it 14, 21 days, whatever it, the case may be later and not have those issues when they're going to get financing. So it has to be conventional type financing. It's not FHA or whatever. Um, but all that being said, you got to reach out and have that logistics set up or, or know that before you ever do it so that you can push those buyers over to that way. Got it. So let's let's move into my, more of the wholesaling side of things and the less advanced. I'm I'm reading the bio on the pad home buyer and, and it looks like which one of you guys would say you're the marketing end of it and you love that side of it. That's this guy. That's this guy, Don. <laughs> so my question to Don is, what do you consider for a newbie one of the best marketing strategies they can do? pretty much now with little or no money. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, for the little or no money, uh, you know, we are doing something similar and, and something we actually learned from you, which is the ringless mm -hmm. uh, and or cold calling. So that's going to have a lower cost uh, that, than what we have for some of the other methods that we use. So um, that's a simple thing that you can do without having to have uh, direct mail going out and having the team to re to listen and respond. Um, but, you know, we're doing the ringless, but I would say, you know, right behind that for us, direct mail. Uh, Midwest direct mail works great. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the coastal markets, you know, not so much. It's more competitive. you got to do certain things. But Midwest direct mail is bread and butter for us. It's We consistently get stuff from it. So that's kind of my next question. So in your business, I'm guessing your direct mail is is the key, the lifeblood of what you're doing. Yeah, um, yeah. what, what are you, how many pieces are you sending a month? Do you have a set amount that you usually do? We're, we're typically <clears throat> averaging anywhere from 10 to 15,000 out. And as long as we can do the 10 to 15,000 out, the return come back is three to four, sometimes five. That'll come from that. Now, obviously you get the low hanging fruit that comes right off the bat where they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then as long as you're staying consistent with the marketing and the follow up, you'll usually get an extra one to three a month off the follow up. So uh, the follow-up is huge, uh, and if you don't have it, you're missing out almost half of what you could have. That's that's pretty uh, that's pretty cool. Now you guys know I don't do any mail, and I and I'm starting to do a hybrid between uh, cold calling and mail. And once I get enough data on that, I'll I'll be able to pass that along. But put you guys on the spot on a deal. If you had to think of a cool deal that you had recently, kind of walk me through a cool deal that you, you had recently and kind of explain the marketing that you used, how it came about and how it ended. Well, I would say the coolest one that we had lately is a deal that we got from another investor that um, they had been applying the wrong strategy. They were trying to do a lease option on what should have been a rehab. And um, when you have these relationships with other investors that develop over time, they're, they're priceless because mm -hmm. That investor called me up and said, hey, can you help me on this deal? And it turned out to be, you know, a $45,000 deal. Um, and wow. she was just applying the wrong strategy. So I think it's really important to work with other investors, especially if you're brand new. Find someone that will work with you because it, it will it will exponentially grow your business a lot quicker. We happen to have met each other and we were both pretty experienced at the time. Uh, yeah. That's some that? good story back there. Geez. <laughs> I see the flash in the background. That's pretty cool. I'd be, um, my mom would be under the table right now, but that's, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have that option. So, um, but Max, I mean, if, if you work with other investors, um, you will exponentially grow and everybody wants that kind of deal because it doesn't cost anything. Correct. And, and that investor would have, 
it would have been a negative proposition for her because she was she just didn't know she was applying the wrong strategy. So I'd say that was the coolest one. If you want the coolest one from male, I would say it's that deal I described before um, about the the person who just said, "Hey, we got your piece of mail. Can you come out today?" And we don't all we this is what we want for the house. We don't care what you do with it. We don't care how much money you make. Just give us this one seventy in that case. And, you know, we turned around, put it right on MLS, and I haven't spent a dime yet. So wow. it cost us, what was the actual cost per lead? What did it come down to? Out the door for us, direct mail, normally we're sitting right around 2500 bucks per deal. So mm -hmm. that's an average of what we spend to get in something. Um, and, you know, with the, the wholesale type methods that we're doing at this point, in the Midwest, you typically see a ten dollars to $15,000 wholesale fee, fee. And every once in a while, you'll get some nice ones, like she brought up with the forty-five thousand. But that's the average. But with the wholesale stuff, you know, we can typically see anywhere from thirty to fifty. Um, so if you can apply the different method because you have the ability and or some of the finances to back it, um, you know, you can possibly double some of the fees that you're making just off of knowing the different method to use. That's awesome. So once you get to a point where you're actually wholesaling it, and go out and I guess spend money on education or just put your head in the books or YouTube and learn other strategies to add tools. And it's crazy. I've been operating for almost two years now and I never did a subject to deal until two weeks ago. I met with Tyler. Um, I went to his office because, you know, we're, we're an hour and a half apart. He talked about some subject to stuff. I studied it. I talked to another buddy and the following week I did a hundred grand in, in subject to and it was like, what? Why was I missing this for such a long time? Um, but that that's so yeah. Adding that stuff to your your tool belt is awesome. Um, another thing that really comes up a lot is you know how do you find and develop relationships with cash buyers because that's the lifeblood of what you're doing. How do you how did you guys build your cash buyers this and how are you continuing to grow it? Uh, well, part of it started with just learning about other investors in the area and, you know, being here as long as I as I have been, I knew a lot of those guys. So we had a little bit of a list kind of set up just from talking to other investors, going to other events like the RIAs and, and other, you know, other real estate investor events. And then it was a lot to do with bigger pockets and getting our deals out to new people. Mm hmm. Uh, and and I think besides bigger pockets, we did a lot of Facebook um, networking and ads, and and then I, I don't remember what else we did. Uh, Craigslist. I mean, as much as people say it's dead, Craigslist does work. It, it works. Pulls. The old. I feel like the old fashioned buyers with cash think Craigslist is still new. So it's like a, a a new thing. Like, honey, I can get on the internet and find houses. <laughs> just <laughs> so no, I think it's I think it still works. Just make sure you know use the right ads. Don't use the same methods everybody else are using, and and I and I think you'll you'll do um, just fine. Now, Amy, this question is to you. A lot of people talk about finding a closing attorney or a title company, and how do they find it? How do they go about it? What would you if you had a newbie sit in front of you in a, in a brand new market, what would you suggest them to do to reach out and find a closing attorney or a title company that can work with them? Well, the first thing you need to figure out is what is your jurisdiction? Is it a title company closing or is it an attorney closing? Because there's two different strategies with mm -hmm. that. Um, to get to the title company, um, one of the ways we found our title company was I just started sending deals to different title companies and saw what kind of a problem they gave me. And the more problem they gave me, the less I worked with them. Yeah. So, I mean, that was part of it. But then I, I took title companies lunch, you know, I mean, I, I really went and got a relationship with them. I went where they were, um, where I knew they were going to be. And if you go to the most title companies websites or even their Facebook page, they're going to tell you right where they're going to be mm -hmm. and so look for the title companies or the real estate attorneys that are recommended by your local RIA talk to other investors. I mean, if you just Google, we buy houses, you're going to find all of your competition right there and do deals with them they'll take you to the best title companies or the best lawyers or whatever you're using in your jurisdiction, but get the guys that are doing work. If, if the guy, if the title company or the real estate attorney doesn't know what an assignment is, hang up immediately and go find another one right away. 
sometimes it's trial and error and sometimes it's just networking and otherwise stop by with a bunch of donuts or pizza or whatever. You're going to make a friend and then ask them, what can I do here? This, I'm a wholesaler. I would like to do this. How are you going to help me do that? And find out from them exactly what they'll let you do. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I say too, is, you know, most of the time you can either go to your local RIA meeting or just go on the local RIA's website. And usually a sponsor is an attorney or a closing company. And if they're sponsoring the RIA, more than likely they're investor friendly and know what an assignment is, know what all these other tools that we use creatively to, to, to buy real estate. So, um, I, I would still interview them though. Honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Because sometimes, I mean, our local RIA has some sponsors that I, I wouldn't work with, you mm-hmm. know, and it's just like anything else. There are bad lawyers. There are good lawyers. There are bad dentists. There are good ones. You need to find the one that you're comfortable with and, and that will work with you. Okay. Now, how how big would you consider, because everybody talks about the Midwest and I'm in a town of 350 people, I think the last census was. How big is the market that you're working in? Well, between all the county, we're in a couple different counties, but we've got a million people. Okay, so um, you got so you have you have you that's that's large compared to, to to my market. Do you how do you deal with quote unquote competitors, or do you see them as competitors? Because that's a question that I get a lot. Is you know, there's there's so many wholesalers in my market. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. How do how do you beat them, Donald? How do you, how do you beat them? At the end of the day, honestly, I've reached out and networked with a lot of them. Uh, I would say one of the bigger rehabbers in uh, our market, I typically reach out to and go have dinner with and have a beer with mm-hmm. every time I'm back. Um, we've gone to appointments where, you know, we've talked to them, we're, we're talking and it's just not working for us. Hey, how about you go out there, you give them an offer, this is where we're at, we'll work together. It may make sense that we work together on the deal. Um, at the end of the day, the competition is really not there. Uh, there's so I, at a million people out there, there's so much out there that really you guys, there's more than enough for him. There's more than enough for us. It just does not matter. Um, we know what we're doing. It works. He does something else at the end of the day. If something works, work together, make it work. Um, just doesn't, I don't see the competition there. I, I don't, you know, I usually I usually say that most people are not consistent enough to be considered competition. Absolutely. You know, right. whatever market strategy you're doing, I like to test something for at least six months to be saying, OK, this is not working or it's working. And I feel like that's good, whether it's just simple bandit signs and you're putting out X amount of bandit signs every week. Don't stop no matter how many calls you get, whatever it is. Or if it's cold calling and you're making 50 calls a day, do that every day for six months and you'll be surprised. Um, what are some of your cheaper marketing methods that you've run across? And you're like, wow that worked. I didn't think that was going to work that quickly or, or that cheaply. Yeah. Um, Facebook, uh, yeah. we've tried Facebook marketing for sellers, uh, and it's actually worked pretty well for us as well as, uh, I would say the, uh, ring list type stuff that we we're not in it far enough that I would say I, I could give you the numbers and be confident that it works. But for us, it's already worked enough that I know cost per lead is lower, um, mm-hmm. than our typical um, and so those two have kind of surprised me uh, in the sense that they're easily scalable uh, to an extent and they're all online. So it's not you having to go out and throw signs in the ground or anything of that such. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've been there. Um, we haven't done bandit signs recently, but I will tell you back six years ago, I was <laughs> up Amy's like, no. in the ground. Um, and I, you know, I didn't do it long enough or consistent enough right. to ever get anything out of it, but I was there. I've done it. I know what it is. Uh, I was the one running out of the car, making sure no one's coming after me, but <laughs> we, uh, you know, we still do it in my market. We, I have a guy that puts out a hundred a week and, uh, believe it or not, that cheap method still brings back two or three deals, you know, every month. And it's just a consistency because people kind of see the sign and they're like, they kind of trust you at that point. It's like, okay, I see the sign everywhere. Let me give this guy a call, even if it's been five or six different locations or whatever. So, it's uh, it's it's pretty cool. Um, what hey, Max, are? Max, yeah. You, I just want to say one thing about the competition thing. Please, I mean, yeah. It, it doesn't cost you anything. The marketing budget is zero to do a deal with another investor. I mean, obviously they have paid 
for however they got the deal together, but it really doesn't cost you anything. And so when it comes right down to it, if you look at everybody as competition, you're going to miss out on a lot of really good deals. Yeah. And because what you know is not the same as what the other investor knows. So, I mean, we're sitting here talking and you know things that we don't know. I mean, mm. that's why we go to groups to continue to learn. So I, I wouldn't minimize that. I, I think finding somebody good, it takes a while, but you know, once, once you put your name out there and you cooperate with people and you do what you say you're going to do, people will send you stuff. We're we get, all, I get calls every week. On we're all deals. working in the same direction, so we might as well work together. I mean, it's Money. I'm going to get a deal that you're not going to see. You're going to get deals I'm not going to see, but you're going to get a deal that you probably don't play in this price range. I have buyers that will spend three, four hundred thousand dollars. Other people don't have those type of buyers. So when you run across those type of things, you it's best to work with people. Um, Don, you mentioned Facebook. Kind of roughly go over what your seller Facebook strategy or lo what it looks like. So we've set ourselves up with a business page and been able to then put out ads through mm -hmm. Facebook, you know, ad manager. Uh, and it's really much like the Bannett signs in that you're putting out a Bannett sign looking type ad in the local market and you're targeting the people uh, out in that local market, upper upper age and, and that zip code or that county that you're looking for. And in return, because you're targeting and Facebook knows kind of where they live and what their age is, you're able to get it in front of those people that you're trying to uh, see if they're interested in selling. Mm -hmm. And then they're able to go into your uh, ad and submit their information and it comes into our, our uh, platform, our CRM platform, and we're able to then reach out and figure out if it's more of a retail or, or something that we can wholesale. Perfect, and, and that's cool because you have the, also the broker side of business, so you have the opportunity to almost not let any leads slip through your fingers unless they just really didn't want to sell, um, which, I, which I think is cool. Um, what are, I mean, this question is for both of you, name two tools or apps or something that you use in your business that you just can't live without. Number one is Podio for sure. And yeah. Of course, Don has his own um, application for that. That's, it's been life-saving for, and, for everything. And explain up. kind of what Podio is for, for people that are not sure. Okay. Sure. Podio is a CRM basically that it comes sort of blank. And then you create it into whatever you want it to look like. So Don's probably, you know, b better to explain given <laughs> we're running off of his platform. So I'll let him kind of go in more detail. But okay. it, it's it's sort of a it's an empty spot to start with, and then you convert it into whatever you want. And so what about an, what about another tool before we get to Don? What other tool do you like just every day? I'm in MLS every day. Because that's really how I calculate after repaired value, and mm -hmm. I look at what other things are selling for. So I could be at a house, pull it up, and and say, okay, look, the house next door sold two weeks ago. It was in perfect condition. That's what I have to be at. So, so before before I go to Don with that question, you brought up MLS, and I it just triggered a question in my head. What is the best way for somebody that is not an agent to? have access or be able to use the MLS to their advantage, like you say, to pull comps? Or is it or is it necessary to have? I'm not a great one to answer that because I've always had MLS mm -hmm. um, other than the first two years that I was working. So but um, if, if another investor calls me up and and needs it, I typically say, oh, OK, look, it's going to cost me 60 bucks to give you access. You pay the 60 bucks and I'll add you as an assistant. Um, just don't mess around and don't give it to anybody else. Yeah. Um, I would only do that for investors I know. Correct. But um, I don't know. Are That's there any cool. other tools? I think there's other tools that, that simulate MLS. I'm just not familiar with them. Okay. So, Don, what about you as far as the two apps that you can't really live without uh, for your wholesaling business? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, Podio, obviously, I've built out what we call beast mode for the CRM. Uh, but besides that, I would say that Slack, um, our mm -hmm. company runs Slack. So oh, sure. explain uh, Slack because I use it. I love it. Explain what you, you do with Slack. So Slack is basically a platform where you create what they call channels and you're able to then have your employees or different departments in those channels. So you can prioritize kind of what's important for you to keep an eye on or respond to. Uh, and it makes it to where you're not constantly looking at your email or your text or whatever the case may be. You know that that's business related and it's department related and then it's, you know, needs your attention now 
and not later tonight when you spend the next hour going through your other stuff. Yeah. It's an email killer. Yeah. You said it's an email killer. You're right. I all my virtualists, all my employees are on that because it's like it's quick, it's to the point, and you're right. You've got everything in 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 order that you want it. Now let let's go back to beast mode because Podio is is something that people you either love it or you hate it, but it kind of depends on your experience and how you started with it. Explain what beast mode is and why you built it. Yeah. So, you know, I had basically self-taught myself how to do uh, Podio and programming and all that good stuff during a time in my life when I was told that I needed to not make some income. I won't explain why or I'll just put that out there. <laughs> there was a time in my life that I had to where I needed to find other activities. And so I YouTubed Podio and at back then Joe McCall was a big Podio guy and I learned from some of his stuff and I self-taught how to, to automate and I built out some platforms that were very complicated, could do everything you could possibly want. And then I learned that, hey, that's hard to scale. So we redesigned to what you now know Beast Mode as and put everything kind of really into one app. So you have all of your appointments, offers, contracts, and follow-up all in one area. And it makes it to where you know stuff is not falling through the cracks. Your follow-up is actually having you know, text messages and ringless voicemail and things like that automatically going out and following up with these people besides the calls that you're doing. Uh, and then as your offers are going out, they're not falling through the cracks. So if they don't get accepted, they go in what we call offer follow-up. And then we go periodically through that and follow up with those offers again and see if it's something that they'd be interested in. Uh, the appointments that don't work out go into appointment follow-up. And we can then send sequences to them as well. But that segregates your data out to now you know the offers are more important. Let's follow up with those and, and put more priority on the people that we gave offers versus the people that were just appointments. And then you have just your regular follow-up. Hey, we never talked to them or never went on an appointment. We're just trying to get back and hold of them. And we put those into follow-up where they get the ring list and the text and you're calling them. And we're just trying to make contact and find out if they are truly uh, ready to sell or wanting to set an appointment. And that's awesome. So essentially, to kind of sum up Beast Mode, it's it it's your central database for your company. When new leads call, when you put new leads in it, it gives it a automatic follow up sequence. Because I'll tell you, when I was when I started, not having, not having something to track my leads, and and I go back to Zillow and I would look on what the price, what the house sold for, which was what I would offer or even more. Um, yeah, it, it really, it really mess, mess with my head. And, and that's when I jumped on, uh, a podio and, and just had to make something for at least follow up. Now your, your thing is out the box. It's, it's, it's when you're now at what point, cause I think that's important. What point do you recommend somebody getting something like beast mode? You know, and that's a good point. <clears throat> and typically I would tell somebody they need to have at least done a handful of deals before they need to worry about a CRM. Um, uh, I've been on different groups where people have asked about CRMs and they're not even yet to a first deal. And I've told them, hey, Excel <laughs> works just fine. You know, remove, <laughs> remove duplicates works just fine at that point. Yeah. But when you start having, you know, 75 and 100 calls a day or even in a week, it becomes a problematic to try to keep up with everybody and have notes on everybody and not let stuff slip through the cracks. So you kind of have to have that fine line of, okay, now we're scaling up and it's time to move over to something that can track that and provide some follow-up on everybody that's coming in. How can how can my listeners check out Beast Mode? Where should they go? If they go over to reiautomationsquad.com, uh, they can get on there, and if they submit a web form on there with their information, uh, they'll be able to get pricing, demo, and, and some other information emailed to them automatically. Cool. So I'll, I'll leave a link below for anybody that wants to check it out in the show notes or in the YouTube uh, notes so they can, you know, check it out. But I, I know CRM, CRMs are very important. Podio is like the master. Everybody uses it for everything. So to be able to have somebody build something custom out of the box for you, for your CRM, it's a good place to start. It's a good place to manage all your leads and make sure nothing slips through the crack because you spend money marketing and you don't want every time something slips through the crack, it's like literally dollars falling in that couch. You cannot get out. Um, so that that's that's pretty awesome. Um, before we wrap this up, um, this is a question for for both of you. What advice would you give a new wholesaler with all the information you know now? If you were starting from beginning, what would you tell them to be able to cut out some of that learning curve or to, to help them accelerate a lot faster and 
Amy, I'm going to pick on you and you go first. That's okay. Um, I would say right away, out the box, you, you need to learn as much as you can before you start throwing money around. And and I if I had to start over and do it again, I would find somebody doing this immediately and beg for their help. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I would do because it would cut years of mistakes out for me. Um, but yeah, learn as much as you can, you know, watch your podcast. You, you give a lot of great information and, um, and just buy the, buy a program, you know, figure out who you want to learn from and do it. Yeah. And don't buy something that's $3,000 to start. Cause no, I mean, no. even, even somebody like Sean Terry, they have much cheaper stuff to get you at least to your first deal. I don't have a program. I don't do one-on-one. -on -one. I don't do mentorship. I just don't have the time because I'm really running a business every day. Um, it's hard enough just to put out these YouTube videos and do these podcasts so I can share what I can. But Don, what about you? What would you tell your younger wholesaling self with all the information you know now? I would pretty much do what it takes to where I could financially be okay to give away free time, whether it's nights, weekends, whatever the case may be. Find somebody locally that's doing it and offer your time for free to learn. I mean, honestly, find somebody that's doing it and then follow their lead because at the end of the day, otherwise you're going to be chasing, uh, you know, the online programs and all the other stuff. At some point you need to be able to break away and say enough is enough. I know enough and now it's time to go do it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that a lot of people fight. That's... Don't be afraid to mess up. You're <clears throat> yeah. Mess I mess up every day. Every day. And I love it because I still make money. So, yeah. and here, here's a word of advice when you're looking for somebody to mentor, don't send them a message, an email, an inbox and say, Hey, I would like to buy you coffee and pick your brain. No, please don't do that. I, <laughs> I, I probably get no exaggeration, 70 to 80 emails or messages a day, something like that, or, you know, something it's very rare that somebody says, Hey, can I do something for you? for you to help me. But that's a good way to kind of get your foot in the door. And, and that's awesome. But um, I appreciate you guys coming on. Um, it's awesome. Thanks, uh, Don and Amy from Pad Home Buyers out there in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, to be exact, but you guys are around. And um, are you guys coming to Charlotte? We will be there. We will be there. Awesome. So I will see you there. That's my backyard. So I will see you guys there in Charlotte in July. Until then, if you have been listening to this podcast this long, please give me a rating. Five stars would be great. Write a review. It helps us with iTunes and all that stuff. Give me a thumbs up on YouTube and share this with anybody you think that might benefit from watching Don and Amy talk about wholesaling. I'll see you guys next time at, you know, whatever we do. I'll see you guys next time. Peace out for listening to the Wholesaling Houses Elite Podcast with Max Maxwell. Make sure to tune in next week to see what elite wholesaler will have in the hot seat.